yesterday's light motif was the return to God. Today, we turn from the broad question of religion to the topic of Jewish-Christian encounters. Uh, this issue is 2,000 years old, but far from, from being outdated or exhausted. Indeed, uh, as most of you know, this is the fifth year that we, a group of about 30 scholars, uh, professors and students, meet regularly, twice a month, here at the Ben Gurion University that became a meeting house of scholarship for us to discuss is issues pertaining to religions, encounters, and the uh, religious encounters, um, religions meaning in our group uh, mainly uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as well. Um, our work was and still is amazingly interesting and fertile. But what we learned most is how much there is still to be learned. So I'm glad and honored to open this panel devoted to patterns of change in Jewish-Christian relations. The panel comprises of scholars from various fields of study, and uh, I'll be very short uh, in my comments and introductions because we have five speakers and uh, our time is limited. Our first speaker is Father Dr. Norbert Hoffman, uh, Father Hoffman is a Catholic Salesian priest ordained in 1990, a biblical scholar in the field of Old Testament with a special interest in intertestamental literature. He studied in um, Benedict Beuren in Germany, Luzern and Zurich in Switzerland, and in Rome at the Pontifical Biblical Institute and the Gregoriana. He is secretary of the Holy See's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews since 2002, which under Cardinal Kurt Koch is responsible for promoting Jewish-Catholic relations on a worldwide level. Please, Father Hoffman. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday when uh, our event was ended, I went to my friend David Rosen and told him everything today was dramatic <laughs> because with his unique style, um, the, everything becomes uh, very vivid. And he said that there was a dramatic change in Jewish-Christian relations after the promulgation of the document Nostra Etate, of the document, the Declaration of the Second Vatican Council that was promulgated the 28th of October of 1965. And he, David Rosen, said also, it is a miracle how Jewish-Christian uh, re uh, relations changed since this time. And I think he is right. It's a dramatic change and it's a miracle. And I, in my brief uh, comments, uh, wish to reflect on why Nostra Aetate was drafted. Uh, why is there this document, a change uh, uh, regarding the attitude of the Catholic Church regarding Judaism and the other religions? I think there are three points. Uh, the third, first point is a reflection on the Shoah. Uh, Christians thought, or Catholic Christians thought, uh, how was this human catastrophe possible? Christians murdered Jewish uh, people. So there was a reflection on this matter and a certain uh, teshuwa, uh, conversion. So conversion is part also of Christianity. The main message of Jesus is convert and believe in the oyangelion, in the gospel. And uh, the gospel is telling us that with Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is coming, was, uh, came on earth. In Jesus, the kingdom was uh, reality. So conversion is part, Teshuvah is part of, of Christian attitude. And after the Shoah, there was the attitude of the Teshuvah to think about, reflect how this human tragedy was possible. 
This is the first point and one of the, the main routes uh, for drafting Nostra Aetate, for rethinking how we are relating to our Jewish brothers and sisters. The second point was a very practical point because in 1948 the State of Israel was founded. And uh, now the Christians here in the Holy Land, they had to get along with the Jewish majority. The Vatican had always two goals here in the Holy Land, free access to the holy sites, to the holy Christian sites, and to regulate the normal pastoral life of uh, the, the, the Catholic parishes and communities here in the land. And because of the political situation, because of uh, security reasons, there were a lot of difficulties regarding a normal pastoral life. So, uh, yes, the Christians were forced to get in dialogue uh, with the Jewish majority here in this land and to be endorsed uh, by the Christians of Europe, to be endorsed by the Vatican. So the state, the foundation of the state of Israel is for me uh, the second motivation for drafting Nostra Aetate or for rethinking how Catholic Christians are relating to, to Judaism. And a third point is for me the progress in biblical sciences. It began under Pius XII. It uh, continued with the Second Vatican Council to see the Jewishness of Jesus. That Jesus was a Jew, was born as a Jew, died as a Jew, and that the first Christians were Jewish people. They lived according to the Jewish traditions of their time. So to understand our own faith, our own religious traditions, it is necessary uh, to uh, have a dialogue with the Jewish people. It's a, it's a matter of our own identity. So I think these three points, the Shoah, reflection about the Shoah, then the foundation of the, of the state of Israel, and in the biblical sciences to focus more on the Jewishness and Jesus, these three points led uh, to Nostra Aetate. And for me, Nostra Aetate uh, is a prophetic text. In 19, it was drafted between 1962 and 1965. The, the fathers of the council, the Second Vatican Council, they, force, they, they, force, they have foreseen the most important points. They are, for me, Nostra Aetate is a decisive yes to the Jewish roots of Christianity and a decisive no to all forms of anti-Semitism. And in Nostra Aetate, there's a commandment to discover more and more the common spiritual heritage that have Jewish, Jews and Christians in common. So Nostra Aetate is the Magna Carta, is a, for me a prophetic text. And this commission, Cardinal Koch is heading, and I'm the secretary of the Commission for Relations with the Jews, uh, we are doing our work to realize more and more this document. Nostra Aetate. And all the other documents produced by our commission are follow-ups. And the last document we spoke about uh, in, uh, released in uh, the, the, the 10th of December 2015 is maybe the largest document and the most theological document because in, in the last times there were a lot of theological questions around and therefore, we decided to, 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 to draft, to, to publish this document. So, uh, I wanted only to give an overview. There is a dramatic change, as David Rosen said, and I wanted to explain why and the background of these changes. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> So our uh, second speaker is uh, Dr. Barbara Meyer. She is a senior lecturer at the Program of, for Religious Studies at Tel Aviv University. Her main fields of research are contemporary Christology and theologies of law and interreligious relations. She is the author of Christologie im Schatten der Shoah, Studien zu Paul uh, van Beuren und Friedrich Wilhelm Markard, and, uh, and other articles on interreligious theology, law, and in Christian post-Shoah thought, 
the Jewish identity of Jesus and ethnic, ethic of otherness, such as the dogmatic significance of Christ being Jewish and applying for otherness. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also have three points, uh, but we didn't work together. <laughs> there might be similar roots um, of thought and other. Um, patterns of change. The repudiation of supersessionism. Because of the Shoah or because of the roots? Has the Catholic Church changed its, its attitude to Jews and Judaism because of the Shoah or because of the roots of Christianity? Just last week, an Israeli student asked this question when hearing for the first time about Nostra Etate. It seems like a question for beginners, but it is actually a very good question, like a working title that encourages discussion, and I'll use it to structure my comments this morning. I'll begin with trying to formulate what exactly has changed, then I describe how the change is presented in church documents and other texts. And finally, I look at theological and historical aspects of that presentation. Um, one more little footnote about the word change. I was told that the Catholic Church does not change and that when the Pope announces women's ordination, he'll introduce a statement with the words, as the Catholic Church has always taught. So that I was told so much about the term change, but now. The change we're talking about, what exactly has changed? The change we're talking about is an overall rejection of Christian supersessionism. The term supersessionism, for, for those not familiar, describes the view that Christianity has superseded Judaism. It is a Christian concept that presents Christianity as inheriting Judaism. According to that view, Christianity has taken the place of Judaism in the history of salvation, or stated even more boldly, in God's heart, or has taken over the blessings, however you put it. Two things are important to remember about supersessionism. It presupposes that the God of Christians is the God of Israel, and it highly values the history of Israel and the ancient texts of the people of Israel, that is, pre-Rabbinic biblical texts, which, make, which makes it different from other forms of anti-Judaism. The term supersessionism is rather young. American Christian scholars developed this term in the framework of a critical assessment of Jewish-Christian relations. So with very few exceptions, the term is not used in identification. There are very few people who say, I'm a proud supersessionist, but as a means of critique and predominantly Christian self-critique. Supersessionism is ecumenically widespread and very consistent in church history, and Christians engaged in its critique and repudiation lament its long proven capacity to unite Christians, not the unifications that we, we, that, uh, we would I like to see, um, to unite Christians at the expense of Jews. Now, the big question underlying the discussion is whether supersessionism can actually be overcome or whether it is inherent to Christianity. And I remember we also discussed that question, we argued about that question. So the, question, the, the underlying question, is supersessionism actually inherent to Christianity? This morning, everybody seems to celebrate the successful repudiation of supersessionism by the Catholic Church, because we're celebrating. But in Israeli academics, it is more typically believed that supersessionism is, in fact, inherent to Christianity, alongside other forms of Christian anti-Judaism that, according to David Nirenberg, change only with regard to their form of articulation. Now, one problem may be that people, scholars as well as students, still find it difficult to imagine a non-supersessionist Christianity. Even in academia, people got used to a Christianity in search of unity, aspiring to make everyone follow Jesus Christ. For instance, Daniel Boyarin, one of the most creative scholars of rabbinic, rabbinic literature and known to Christians also on account of his pioneering views on the parting of the ways, sees Christianity 
since Paul and until today as striving for sameness and consistently and continually not allowing for difference. Non-supersessionist or anti-supersessionist, and soon I'll talk about post-supersessionist Christian thought, seems to be a reduced version of Christianity. This is due to an error very common in religious studies, the error of regarding a more aggressive religious tradition as somewhat more authentic than a thought tradition capable of expressing affirmation of a different community of interpretation. So how shall we picture non-supersessionist Christians? Some are sitting here. They are those who connect to the story of the God of Israel with the people Israel as a story constitutive of themselves without presenting their telling of the story as a revised and improved edition. Post-supersessionist Christians, the little word post just signifying awareness and self-reflection, may be imagined as telling this story and inviting Jews, not to join, but as interlocutors, thus attributing meaning to the people Israel's present memory of the story. Now, I started off in deliberately simple style. Now you noticed. These formulations about telling the story as your own, but not exclusively as your own, but considering the other and allowing for the other's counter-narrative, you noticed this sounds complicated. It is. The supersessionist Christian rationale is fairly easy to explain. Everything was getting old, the covenant, the law, and the narrative. Then Jesus came with the offer of something new, lots of love, grace, spirituality. The old was then depicted as obsolete and the new as an advancement. Even the more tolerant Christians of the Age of Enlightenment, like Lessing, would present this idea of progress and improvement. Supersessionist Christianity is easily portrayed, and supersessionist patterns of Jewish-Christian relations are easily explained. In contrast, the non-supersessionist Christian narrative displays endless complexity. It's in fact an open-ended story, an open-ended story of, of thought. If Christianity understands itself as vulnerable to present Jewish interpretation of history and scripture, then the Christian story is not in the church's hand alone. But this is all precisely what, in my view, makes Christian contemporary thought so interesting. Now about presenting change. Nostra Etat is a short document. I personally have learned to admire this text. The text includes sentences that still sound supersessionist, but have been interpreted as non-supersessionist in the 2015 document, The Gift and the Calling of God. The Gifts and the Calling of God are ir irrevocable. I heard people say, oh, this document is longish. Maybe it was myself preparing the students for it. It's long. It's complex, it's complicated. It's exactly what happens when the Christian narrative is being told in affirmation of Jewish continuity, in attentiveness to current Jewish discourse, and with interest also in chapters of history and texts not shared like the rabbinic tradition. This is how this uh, document was produced. Um, going back to our simplifying binary question, how is the repudiation of supersessionism presented as soul searching after the Shoah or as a search for the roots of Christianity? The text of Nostratata lets Paul speak. So it's not as the Catholic Church has always taught, but it is as always has been said in Scripture. Paul can be quoted, can be quoted for explicitly renouncing the idea of God disinheriting the people Israel in Romans. Um, in the letter to the Romans, has God cast away his people? By no means. The Shoah is not mentioned in Nostra Aetate. Of course, is Nostra Aetate a post-Shoah document? But Christian post-Shoah theologians have usually tried to present their views as true beyond the catastrophe. This is true also for academic theology and Protestant theologians just like, for example, the New Testament scholar Lloyd Gaston, who in 19... 87 book wrote in his uh, foreword to his book on Paul, 
The aim of the present study is not apologetic, for it has been written not out of guilt toward Israel, but out of gratitude to Israel that a new perspective allows us to pose questions in a new way. It deals not with how Paul can be understood in a post-Auschwitz situation, but with how the recognition of living Israel might help us to a better understanding of Paul in his own situation. Lloyd Gaston um, in 87. Now, theological aspects of the change with this um, I'm finishing. It is important to note here that the idea of Christianity replacing the Jewish people in an economy of salvation has not been a dogma of one of the ecumenical creeds formulating Christian belief in the fourth century. Thus, the Catholic Church and also individual Protestant theologians and synods and uh, Protestant churches generally do not use the Shoah for their argumentation. This is true, Lloyd Gaston, Paul Van Buren, Roy Eckert, um, just to name a few big names of the first generation post supersessionists They are right, dogmatically, to present non-supersessionist Christianity as the true Christianity. But still, the idea that original truth is more adequate a reason for change than the Shoah this is already based on a hierarchy of dogma and ethics that Christianity developed since the fourth century. And whether this hierarchy of dogma and ethics is inherent to Christianity, that's a different question. It's, it's my favorite question, but we talk about it some other time. Um, supersessionism, the idea of disinheriting somebody else, has never been a friendly and appreciative idea. But post Shoah, this thought pattern can be dia diagnosed as eliminatory thought, as, to say it clearly, as genocidal thought. It's a genocidal thought pattern. And this is why I suggest that the repudiation of supersessionism needs to be argued with both Christian truth and European history. Thank you very much. Um, we now turn to, to uh, Professor uh, Claude Dov Stuczynski. He is a, a professor at the Department of General History at Bar Ilan University and a board member of the Center for the Study of Conversions and Interreligious Encounters here at Ben Gurion University, our, our uh, group. Uh, having written a number of contributions in various languages, his two main fields of research are the Portuguese Converso phenomenon and the first encounters between Europeans and Ameri Amer Indians. He is mainly interested in the relationship between religion and politics in medieval and early modern periods, and actually he prepares a study of the theological political dimension of the Converso ph phenomenon, what he calls the Marano Paulinian moment. Please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Olga. My apologies. I had to change the chair because otherwise, instead of speaking ex cathedra, I had to speak de cathedra. <laughs> Sorry. Uplifting up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in one of his visits to my home in Abu Tor, Jerusalem, more than 15 years ago, my beloved master, neighbor, and friend, late Father Marcel Dubois, told my wife and myself the following story. After giving somewhere in France a long lecture on how Christians should improve their views on Jews and Judaism, since among others, the mother of God, the, 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 the mother of the God, the son, was an Yiddish mame, someone within the public raised the hand and asked it, but tell me, Father, what Jews and Judaism think about Christians? Father Dubois' immediate answer was nothing, rien du tout. Struck with such a response, you will probably evoke the unlimited love of Father Dubois for the Jewish people and his tireless fight 
as a devoted Catholic against any expression of Christian anti-Judaism. However, what at first glance might appear as an apologetic inaccurate answer actually reveals a deep truth concerning the asymmetrical character of the religious dialogue between Christian and Jews. Whereas for the former, Judaism is a constitutive part of the Christian heritage, and therefore a dialogue with Jews merge as an exercise of self-definition, from a religious perspective, a Jew doesn't depend on the Christian faith and culture to accomplish his or her particular way of living. This idea was crudely formulated by Daniel Boyarin in the introduction of his provocative study on St. Paul, a radical Jew, 1994, that a professing Jew doesn't ask any ecumenical love or care. Rather, he seeks to be left in peace and molested. I believe that such fundamental asymmetry also entails a misunderstanding regarding the term Judeo-Christianity when it's employed by Christians and by Jews. For Christians, Judeo-Christianity is an idea which organically stems from its own soteriological views, as encapsulated by St. Paul in his epistle to Romans chapter 11. For Jews, however, an acknowledgement of a Judeo-Christian alliance is a relatively new phenomenon, especially from the times of the Jewish Enlightenment and the political emancipation of the Jews during the 19th and the, and the 18th and the 19th century. Etymologically speaking, the origin of the composite word Judeo-Christianity is attributed to the German Protestant theologian and founder of the Tübingen School of Theology, Ferdinand Christian Bau, 1792-1860, to differentiate Peter's Judeo-Christian incipient church from Paul's Gentile Christianity. Bau perceived Judeo-Christianity as an inferior stage in the history of the church, which was quickly superseded by the more sublime and all-inclusive Hellenic form of Gentile Christianity. It must be said, however, that when Judeo-Christianity is employed by Christian from a broader perspective, is rarely associated with Bau's quasi-Marcionite theological penchant, unless employed stricto sensu by historians of the Second Temple and the Primitive Church, such as Simon Claude Mimouni. However, there is always a danger that the Judeo-Christian couple we turn to be a synonym of the traditional theological supersessionism endorsed by past Christian theologians and leaders as denoting a transition from carnal Israel Judaism to spiritual Israel Christianity. The French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard criticized the use of the concept precisely because the hyphen in the word Judeo-Christianity endorses historical, theological, and cultural dependence of the former vis-a-vis -vis the latter, without taking into consideration that Judaism is not only the religion of the Old Testament, but rather of the Tanakh and even more the Talmud. It is in this context that we certainly must welcome the efforts made by the major authorities of the Catholic Church since the Holocaust, from Nostra Etate to our days, to restitute the religious, cultural, and political dignity to Jews and Judaism, thus avoiding any form of hatred, but also, as much as possible, any form of paternalism, even if driven by sincere philosemitic feelings, feelings and concerns. I somewhat tempered my initial enthusiasm by adding the word 
as much as possible, also because Judeo-Christianity has other unavoidable shortcomings. On the one hand, it is true that major 20th century Jewish thinkers, such as Franz Rosenzweig and Martin Buber, conferred to Christian and Jews the common task of disseminating the kingdom of God on earth through a division of labor between both religions by employing different means, either through the law of Moses or through Christ, or by endorsing two different ways of conceiving faith, emuna or pistis, to be addressed to two essentially different audiences, Jews and non-Jews. As I mentioned yesterday, during Yossi Israeli's analysis of Nostra Etate, these Paulinized ways of conceiving Judaism undermine the universal vocation of Judaism, especially when contemplating the conversion of non-Jews to Judaism, including former Christians. In certain historical cont contexts, we must to confess, such as during Nazism, Judeo-Christianity was employed in a very salutary way, also by Jews, to fight racial determinism. However, in his seminal essay, Quelques réflexions sur la philosophie de l'Hitlerisme, 1934, the Jewish-French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas reminded that Judaism, Christianity, but also secular renaissance and enlightenment forms of humanism along with socialism shared a common optimistic idea of the human being as capable of ethically surpass their biological nature. For otherwise, to endorse the idea that the West is Judeo-Christian because it endorses common Jewish and Christian values, ipso facto implies the exclusion of other heritage, such as Islam. No wonder if today Judeo-Christianity is a concept particularly cherished by conservative and xenophobic elements, whether in Europe, in the United States, or here in Israel. I must confess that a menage a trois between Jews, Christians, and Muslims is very conflictive. At the same time, for the sake of truth, we cannot deny the long-standing contribution made by Christians and Jews, especially in what we call the West. However, I think that an uncritical use of the term Judeo-Christianity brings more problems than solutions in our globalized and multicultural world. Let me end my talk by making a counter-distinction between a religious and a historical aspect of Judeo-Christianity. From my personal standpoint of being a Pharisee Jew, I fully endorse Father Dubois' rien du tout statement. I think that the better way to theologically respect another religion is to let be what they want to be. In other words, I prefer respect to potentially suffocating love. At the same time, since in this world we live all together Jews, Christians, along with Muslims, members of other religions, agnostic and atheists, we cannot avoid the fact that respect can be ensured only through policies of respect, which includes a dignified knowledge of the other. In other words, as an Israeli Jew, I don't need to be a Judeo-Christian to give the respect deserved to Christian and Christianity. However, I cannot opt by choosing neutral indifference. For historical speaking, Jews and Judaism responded to Christian and Christianity in different ways, sometimes including prejudices and 
hostility. This means that my personal duty as an historian is to try to influence the politics of Jewish memory vis-a-vis -vis the Christian past as much as we can. This is precisely what we do here in our Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters. At the same time, as an observant Jew and an Israeli citizen, I cannot stay indifferent vis-a-vis -vis expressions of disrespect and hatred that Christian suffers in this country in the name of my beloved religion. In this sense, even if theologically speaking, Christianity is not a matter of Jewish concern, the historical, the social, and the political contemporary reality urgently call all of us, and more particularly, the Jewish religious leaders to publicly depict Christian and Christianity as dignified way of being others, for let's human others, for let's remind all of us, Jews, Christians, and others, we were equally created after God's image. Thank you. We now return to Professor Ephraim Meir, who is a professor emeritus of modern Jewish philosophy at Bar Ilan University. He is the Levinas guest professor for Jewish dialogue studies and interreligious theology at the Academy of World Religions, University of Hamburg, and president of the International Rosenzweig Society. Please, Professor Meir. Thank you so much. Nostra Aetate is a maestro because it uh, contributes to a more favorable climate of Catholics towards the Jews. It is not a perfect text. I could mention, for instance, the appearance of Novos Israel which has a superstitionist flavor. But it is not important. What important is that here is, for the first time, after the shock of the Shoah, a text which reaches out to the Jews, which recognizes also the Jewish heritage. It is true that it is oriented rather to the past than to the future of Judaism. But it is the first text of the church in the history of 2,000 years where you see an official Catholic text where you see that there is an outstretched hand to the Jews. So it is an important text. And of course, this document didn't escape the attention of the Jews. But the reaction came late. And one can understand it, why the reaction was late. I'm referring here to the Dabru Emet document, which was issued in the year 2000, signed by 200 scholars and rabbis from the states, where they say that they applaud what was said in Nostra and the positive steps that were made by the Catholic Church towards the Jews. So they say the Catholic Church now, in 2000, Says, says that they have the same God, they share the same Hebrew Bible, they have common moral principles, and they recognize also, the church also recognizes 
Israel, the state of Israel. Because Israel, it is said it in the document, is the physical element of the revelation to the Jews. And of course, they add, we have to realize justice in the land. They are against assimilation, these rabbis and scholars in 2000. And they say, we have to respect the autonomy of the religions. And the Catholic Church does that. It's a very positive uh, reaction where they are creating a kind of common ground between Christians and Jews. When I so see this document in the broader framework of uh, what's happening in the American jury. Because Soloveitchik said, as the lonely man of faith, that you can't share your own intimate narrative, your Jewish narrative, with people who are not Jews. But Abraham Joshua Heschel, with this sympathetic voice, of a, a prophetic voice of sympathy for the divine pathos, said that we have to be in touch with Christians. Soloveitchik did not applaud the pilgrimage of Heschel to Rome. Heschel thought, as a man who came from the Shoah, he thought that one has to help the others in order to overcome their biases. And he went to Rome and spoke with the Pope. He was influential with Julie Zak for the content and the genesis of Nostra Aetate, number four. So we see here an interesting evolution that until today there are people who are saying in the States, Jews in the state, they are saying, what is the relationship with Christians? Riadutu, <laughs> nothing. They have nothing to say about it. And others who are saying, we live together with, with Christians, so let us think about coexistence and understanding and appreciating each other. In 2015, two years ago, we have a statement of Orthodox rabbis, an amazing document in which it says that uh, Christians and Jews are partners. The document refers to Yaakov Emden, who appreciated Jesus, and who said that an organization which is for the sake of heaven will endure, which reminds us, of course, for the Hebrew speakers among us, the saying of uh, 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 Rabbi Yochanan Sandlar, where he says, uh, It's in the Mishnah. So this is an amazing positive document, a reaction to the changes which occurred in the Catholic, and the, uh, Catholic Church and the Christian churches in general. It's a very positive uh, document. And I think this is, this is the good direction. This is the way one goes together. And of course, there are always setbacks from both sides. Uh, I could mention Kurt Waldheim, the, the Carmelite uh, convent in Auschwitz, uh, uh, the, the entire question of the beatification of Pius, Pius XII. Let's not go into that. The future lays before us. The important thing is to see what's coming up. And already Franz Rosenzweig, you mentioned by Dov here, already Franz Rosenzweig said that Christianity and Judaism are a double response to the revelation, which is resumed in the words, Weafta, thou shalt love as alone as uh, 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 today. So it's a double response, and it's important, the copula end, end. It's the, it's the 
the term mystery was used here, is a mystery of human life. When you can say end, you make an end to your solipsism reaching out to the other. Now, Franz Rosenzweig said Judaism is the fire and Christianity are the race. Can the, uh, uh, can the fire without the recognition of the race? Can the race without recognizing the fire? It will extinguish. So there is a kind of interdependence in a way. This interdependence has to be taken seriously also from the Jewish side. History alone is not enough. We have to build new theologies. And I'm expecting from Christian uh, theologians that they build really a theology, it's a task for the future, a theology of Judaism. Just as Rosenzweig had built from the Jewish side a, 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 a theology of Christianity. So we can learn from each other Buber said it already, the collective, uh, Jews are good in collective, and they can learn from Christians who know about the individual. And the Christians can learn about the collective from the Jews. So there is a kind of interdependence. It's in, in the end of his uh, mm -hmm. uh, two types of faith, Zwei Glaubensweisen, where you see that he is really outreaching. Although I have to tell you that in 1950, when he wrote the book, uh, uh, on the two types of faith, he um, distinguishes between emunah trust and pistis, you mentioned that too, uh, pistis as the dogmatic faith, so to say. In my eyes, two types of faith is not the best book of Buber. It's too typ typological. I mm, meet Jews who have a much lot, lot of pistis. And I meet Christians who have a lot of emuna. <laughs> Things are more diff different than this. More difficult than, than, than what Buber is, is writing. But Buber did a great job because he said you only can understand Jesus from his Jewish milieu. He did a big mistake in my eyes saying that Paul was the inventor of uh, uh, of uh, Christianity, and here, of course, David Flusser also in his historical work was confirming that. I think in the new scholarship, the Jewish scholarship of today, and we, <laughs> you again mentioned it, and you too, Daniel Boyer and, uh, and other people, they are saying that Paul is more in continuity uh, with uh, Jesus uh, than is uh, thought by uh, people like uh, Martin Buber. So, uh, Paul is the kind of uh, a Jew who, enlarge the, who enlarges the, the covenant and says, of course, the Goyim, the, the uh, Gentiles, do not have to observe the mitzvot because they are not Jews. The Jews have to continue, but the non-Jews are not obliged. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. It is a genius. Paul was a genius. In that way, a religious genius, he, he enlarged the covenant. And that you can read with people like uh, uh, Dunn and, uh, and uh, Boyarin and Mark Nanos and uh, a series of other Jewish thinkers who are bringing Paul nearer to Jesus than in the past. And Jesus himself, as a very interesting point I'm going to finish, it's a very interesting thing. The, today's Jewish scholarship on Jesus stresses the transcendent element in Jesus. If you read uh, Shachter Shalomi, Shalomi Shachter, Zalman, if you read um, people like um, Daniel Matt, they have a kind of uh, Hasidic, uh, uh, Kabbalistic uh, uh, paradigm in which they say, um, Jesus is a, was a tzaddik, a kind of mediator between his apostles and the almighty God. So it's a kind of mediator, a, a kind of supernatural person uh, who uh, tried to, um, to bring 
says Daniel Matt, a kind of inner redemption. Not the outer redemption, inner redemption. And also the, mess the uh, messianic element in Jesus is uh, uh, underlined by some scholars. I'm thinking about uh, Irving Greenberg, who is talking about the failed messiah, but the failed, uh, a messiah, but the failed messiah. And uh, 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 other people who are saying that uh, this is the, the messiah, Ben Yosef. <laughs> so it is not a complete uh, messiah, but it is a messiah. So, and uh, so things are very, very um, complicated in order to to study all this entire history of religions. I have big hope, and I'm finishing with that. In today's developing dialogical theology, we see how religions learn from each other from what Alon would say, the wisdom in other religions. And this is a big hope, because if we have this Buberian presence, the Gegenwärtigkeit, the presence, the openness, without bias, towards the other, we can learn to understand him as he want or she wants to understand herself. And this is a kind of redemptive movement in which we can uh, develop First of all, intensive listening to what religious others have to say. Secondly, translate in our worlds, because we have to translate, there is no other possibility. And third, to, be, to exert hospitality, to receive the other uh, in a way that he can uh, feel at home. So, dear Cardinal, feel at home here. And you too, the assistant of the Cardinal, I'm glad you invited me. So, uh, having in mind all we have heard in the last two days and also now about the image of the other, and uh, also having in mind Dove's call for respect and responsibility of Jews as well, and not only of Christians, uh, towards the other, that's, I mean, towards Christianity, uh, I'm very glad to invite now uh, Dr. Amitai Mendelssohn uh, to give his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ora. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and I'm very honored to be here today in your presence and presence of these wonderful scholars. Uh, I would like to show you a presentation. It might be a bit long, uh, so I'll, I'll try to shorten it because I know that we're running out of time. Uh, this um, presentation, uh, sh I will show you images from a large-scale exhibition uh, that the Israel Museum held, finished a few months ago. Uh, and I think it was an uh, interesting thing to see also with the re reaction of public to this exhibition. Christians, Jews, Muslims, um, the big public that comes to the museum daily. Uh, this is in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. The show was called Behold the Man. <clears throat> Actually, it was called Jesus in Israeli Art, but I wanted to add the issue of Jewish art into here because the introduction was Jewish art, of course. And I'm going to show you uh, a presentation of this exhibition and how Actually, the question was how the figure of Jesus, um, the complex, uh, multi-layered figure of Jesus, entered into Jewish and Israeli art. And what was the meaning of that, of that um, presence of, of this figure, so closely connected to Judaism and, on the other hand, so uh, alien? Actually, the two, the two notions of being a brother and the other. Think of those two words. Uh, I use them quite a bit in my dissertation and in, in the text and the book for the exhibition because brother and other would actually form a sort of a uh, way to look again at the figure of Jesus. And the way he um, was depicted throughout Jewish and Israeli art from the 19th century to the present was fascinating for me uh, to, to explore. And actually, I... Um, in the end of the, of the uh, research, realized how much his figure can be seen as a symbol, sometimes clear, sometimes a bit obscured, sometimes hinted, sometimes very, very direct, uh, 
a symbol that really goes through from the 19th century until today, and I think reflects a lot of the issues that were uh, spoken about today, and a lot of the history, the, the harsh and good and bad parts of the history of Christian and Jewish relations. So let's start with just a few images from the exhibition uh, without getting into them, just, just for you to see. Uh, some of you were there, and uh, for those who weren't, I brought you a few images of the show. A very large exhibition. Um, all the works are by Jewish artists, very important to say, and all of them have, in different ways, um, either the image of Jesus or uh, symbols that have to do with, with the image of Jesus. Um, and I'm going to go through these images more closely soon. Uh, the four points that I want to make before starting to look deeply into the works are, I think, the four possibilities in which Jewish artists looked at the figure of Jesus and um, brought him into their art. And just to understand that art is always a way of seeing things in a different way. Because through art, I think we can look at things in, in, in ways that we usually don't look at them. I think artists are usually the first to kind of think out of the box and to think in unconventional ways and to, to include Jesus inside of Jewish and Israeli art is totally thinking out of the box, out of convention, out of tradition. And I think many times artists preceded, or actually uh, came before uh, or with um, very modern and unconventional ways of thinking in that sense. Um, so let me just go through this and we'll see others. Yeah, I wanna look at this image soon, I'll get back to it. That's just a, a very, um, I was just walking through the gallery and I saw this man looking at this beautiful painting by Maurizi Gottlieb, and I got a chance to take a quick photo of that. I'm happy I got that. Um, so the four issues that were, uh, I think, the basic issues that which I want to look at when looking at the figure of Jesus in Jewish and Israeli art are, one, Jesus as a symbol of a bridge between Jews and Christians. And I think here we have an example of it. I'll just get back to it soon. The second point would be uh, Jesus as a symbol for the for the uh, Jewish suffering, Jesus as a symbol for the Jew as a victim, as a victim of anti-Semitism. In, in that sense, Jesus against anti-Semitism and in that sense also against the church in a way. Uh, we'll see examples of that. The third point would be Jesus as a symbol of the rebirth of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. That's, I think, one of the interesting points that I will try to make uh, Jesus as a form of, uh, as a symbol of Zionism. And the fourth would be Jesus as a symbol of an outcast, battling the establishment, and in that sense as a model for a social, political protest and even for personal identification of many actually more modern and contemporary artists. So here we see Maurizi Gottlieb, I think one of the most important, if not the most important, Jewish 19th century artists. You all know the famous painting of Yom Kippur, Jews praying in Yom Kippur, hung permanently in the Tel Aviv Museum. These two paintings were actually painted in that same year, the last year of his very short life. He died in the age of 23. Um, and they both have in their center the figure of Jesus. One is Christ preaching in Capernaum, and the other is Christ before his judges. I cannot get into the complexity of these two paintings in, in the very short time that we have. I think I could give about an hour about each one of them. But just look at the way Jesus is depicted in the, um, towards the end of the 19th century. Wearing a talit, preaching to a crowd. Not all of the crowd are Jews. Some of them, I hope you see some details there. I don't know if you can see some details. Well, anyways. Some of them are Jews, some of them are Romans, women, men, all together in a crowd of people listening. This is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we see one of the most dramatic, if not the most dramatic moments in Jewish and in Christian history. Jesus before the Sanhedrin on the left-hand side and the Romans on the right-hand side. You see Pontus Pilatus sitting way back there. In the, I'll need some more details here. So Jesus in the center, and I think uh, what Gottlieb is telling us in a, in a nutshell in these paintings is that Jesus was a Jew. This was told before, of course. 
Jesus was a, a, a victim of his um, time, of, of the ways that he looked at reality that were different from uh, the general way that the Jews saw things, and, and, and in that sense, he was a victim. And, and, and I think uh, Gottlieb shows this in a very sensitive way, and also in a very much, very much identifying himself with the figure of Jesus. He always depicts himself in right next to Jesus on the right-hand side and listening to him on the left-hand side. So without getting too much deeply into these wonderful works by this incredibly important 19th century Jewish artist, uh, we will go on to another artist, more or less at the same time, Malkan Tukolsky, working in Russia in the late 19th century, on the, towards the late 19th century, 1876. And here we have a quote, and I'll just read it to you. I want to show Jesus as a reformer who rebelled against the injustice perpetuated by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He lived and died as a Jew for the truth and brotherhood. This is the reason why I would like to create him as a pure Jewish type and represent him with a covered head. So this is the first time, actually, two years before Gottlieb, that a Jewish artist represents Jesus as a Jew with a kippah, with um, peot, um, and his image is the image of the outcast, of the person who stands against the establishment. And actually, in, the, in this time in Russia, and through other letters by Antokolsky, the meaning was that this is Jesus against the establishment of the anti-Semitic church. So this is a very revolutionary way of looking at the figure of Jesus by a Jew, and a very important Russian artist who was actually accepted to the Russian academia and, and became very famous as a Russian artist, not always dealing with Jewish issues, but with this piece, I think was one of his most important works, and actually he thought of it as one of his most important pieces. We move to maybe the most important Jewish uh, artist of the 20th century, Mark Chagall, who many people in Israel don't realize this, but I think people outside of Israel realize it maybe even more, has an obsession with, had an obsession with the figure of Jesus. And actually Pope Francis uh, was asked what was his favorite painting. And he mentioned the white crucifixion by Mark Chagall, which is very interesting in the sense of how Christianity looks again at Jewish representations of, of the figure of Jesus. Uh, again, not to get too much into this wonderful and very complex uh, painting, I'm talking about the left-hand side, just uh, a look at the figure of Jesus as a symbol of Jewish suffering, right in the center of the, right in the middle of the Holocaust, 1943. Chagall escaped France, and he was then uh, painting this painting in, in New York after escaping Europe. And looking at this figure of Jesus with the tefillin, with the um, uh, Torah scroll, uh, many Jewish elements all around him. Of course, the Holocaust is happening around him, and he is now a symbol of the Jewish victim. He is now a symbol of Jewish suffering. So this would be like the opposite of how anyone would conceive the figure of Jesus before this. In that sense, Chagall was, was, uh, was really doing something that was very, very, very revolutionary, uh, of course, with art and and in general, I think, thinking about the Christian-Jewish relations. On the other hand, on the other side, we have a painting uh, that was painted uh, uh, right after the Nazis entered Vitebsk, the city Chagall grew up in, and, and looking at this from afar, he was thinking of Vitebsk as a place where Jews were being crucified. Um, a, a beautiful, I think, example of how Christian Judaism can, can kind of become one in sense of symbols is the Bible by uh, Fray Moshe Lilian, in which you see the menorah and the cross. Lilian, a Jewish artist who was very much uh, um, part of the Zionist movement, a very close friend of Herzl, uh, was commissioned by the Lutheran Church in, in Germany to make this, uh, to, to illustrate the Bible. The Bible was distributed in, in hundreds and thousands of churches in Germany and in the States. And the cover of the Bible, I think, tells all of the, the way Jewish, a Jewish artist can really do that, uh, uh, combine the Old Testament and the New Testament without being afraid of that. Uh, this is just an example of how Jewish uh, themes, specifically Jewish themes like the sacrifice of Isaac or the, the binding of Isaac can very much look like um, Christian uh, prototypes, of course. Now, I can't get into that too much. Another very important painting, and I think a very important painter, and here we're going into the Israeli uh, art that was made in Israel, and, and one of the most important artists in Israel, early Israeli art, is Reuven Rubin. 
a painting called The Temptation in the Desert. So obviously he was thinking about Christian elements and Christian iconography, and just to look at a few examples of Christian iconography that has to do with that scene of the temptation, and or the scene of, uh, uh, oh sorry, it's in Hebrew, but <laughs> it's uh, Jesus in Gethsemane, and, and Paul Gauguin painting himself as Jesus in Gethsemane. So all these uh, Christian Jewish issues looking at Christian uh, iconography come up with early Israeli art. Another work by Ruven Rubin, The Encounter, Jesus and the Jew, um, a very strange painting that took a long, a long time to understand, but I think it means in this painting is that the meaning Ruven was thinking was the old Judaism is, uh, is, is kind of dying, or at least um, this is what he was looking at, at, at Judaism being a very old religion. Uh, Jesus, in a strange way, and I think some of you might find this strange, and I think it is a bit strange. I think he, he looked at Jesus as a symbol of Zionism, of rebirth. Not as an anti-Jewish symbol, but as a symbol of something that Judaism has to go through. And this is 1922. He came back, came to Palestine in 1923 to become part of the Zionist uh, uh, movement here. Another painting that is really the same in that sense is the Madonna of the Vagabonds, the, uh, the Madonna who, who, who is giving birth on the land of Israel, on the land of Palestine then, and the baby Jesus as a symbol of this rebirth of the Jewish people. So here we have an interesting thing. Zionism as the movement of the rebirth of the Jewish people is being um, mediated to the public through Christian imagery and through specifically the figure of Jesus and Mary. <laughs> That's the, well, I'm going to skip a few because I think we're running out of time. But this is just to give you a few images. And uh, another interesting, I think, uh, painting that was kind of revealed for the first time in this exhibition is a painting by Moshe Castell, a very religious, uh, a person who came from a very religious Jewish family in Jerusalem, very religious family. He later be, became more secular, but in a strange way, in a time of great uh, suffering, personal suffering, he lost his child. His child was, uh, uh, died in the age of two or three. He went to a, to a monastery next to the Kinneret uh, for about a year and painted, one of the things he painted was this very strange but illuminating and powerful painting called, uh, untitled actually, but on the top you see it says, if you can read it, it says Castel, uh, it's Castel Hayudi, which is kind of, interesting. He's looking at himself as the figure of Jesus, but not believing in the divinity of Christ, but thinking of the, of the suffering and how he can identify with that. Uh, works that have to do with the Holocaust, uh, a very powerful image on the right. This is, these are works by Moshe Hoffman that are called Six Million and One. So I think with all of the discussion we just had about Nostra uh, Etate and how, and how the Holocaust reflects on Jewish-Christian relationship, here we see the Nazi guard taking down Jesus from the cross, leaving the halo on the cross and leading him through to the line of the Jews that are, uh, that are going to the, to the uh, gas chambers. So it's really, a, a, I think, one of the most powerful images in the exhibition, not very well known before it was exhibited. Um, works by more contemporary artists like Igal Tumalkin, who took a bed, a soldier's bed, and, uh, and, and turned it into a cross, referring to the Lebanon War of the 1980s, and looking at Israeli soldiers as the new victims, and then looking at the victim as uh, the, uh, the typical or, or the archetypical image of the victim would be the figure of Jesus. But then the Israeli soldier, who is, who is uh, uh, soldiers who were dying in the Lebanese war became uh, equivalent with that image. I think that's also a very interesting way of looking at, at the figure of Jesus. Another would be this, it's called, sorry for the Hebrew, it's called Bedouin crucifixion, looking at the Bedouin population and reflecting on their suffering using the image of the crucifixion. Oh, taking from this, uh, a work by Moshe Gershuni who, who, who um, uh, combined the Jewish symbol of suffering, the, the, the yellow star with the cross and with biblical text from uh, the Bible saying, referring to Beit HaMikdash and, to, uh, and, and in that sense, uh, the image of God turns into a combination of the cross and the, the yellow star. And we, we'll move on because uh, we're running out of time, right? Yeah, I have to 
will run fast. Even Menashe Kaddishman, who we all know very well, and, uh, and, and we all know the sheep that he used in many, many different occasions. And this image of a sheep, uh, I found connected very closely to images of icons and, of course, to the famous uh, images of uh, Agnus Dei. So even this very Israeli uh, image of sheep connected to a Christian prototype. Other artists that connected to the figure of Jesus were Moti Mizrahi, who, who uh, one of his performance works was to walk through the Via Dolorosa with the image of himself as a suffering artist on his back, or this image by Efrat Natan of, of the um, undershirts as a kind of a symbol of the new Israeli chalutz pioneer, but in a crucifixion uh, format. A beautiful uh, photograph by Micha Kirchner by, of a, uh, uh, um, a woman who was put in prison in 1988, a Palestinian woman. And here I think it's interesting because we have a Muslim woman, a Jewish photographer, and a Christian symbol of the Pieta or of the baby and of the, of the Madonna and child. And look at the cloth the baby is wearing. It looks very much like a talit. So that, that was a connection, I thought everyone kind of saw it, but it was a connection from Chagall, who painted Christ crucified with a talit, to uh, a contemporary work, or a more contemporary work from the 1980s that had to do with the intifada and with the terrible situation of Palestinians and how uh, and, and, and identifying, identifying with their suffering through a Christian symbol, again, with a Muslim woman. Another work that kind of goes that way is, is a work from 2008 comparing a photograph taken in the uh, Intifada to uh, a, a Christian, a very famous painting by Raphael of the Deposition and uh, a more personal painting. And just to, can, to end, this is my last image, a very famous uh, photograph by Adines, one of our most famous contemporary artists, uh, photographers who uh, uh, staged this Last Supper, he doesn't call it that way, but of course you see it's a Last Supper of Israeli soldiers uh, in an army base. And um, I think that would be a very good way to, can, to finish my talk, because uh, if you look at the Last Supper, it's the beautiful masterpiece by Leonardo da Vinci in Milano from the end of the 15th century, and take that image and put it in Israeli society of today, soldiers going to, the, to maybe, maybe their last meal, um, but it looks a little bit different. It doesn't look exactly like the Leonardo, but it's contextualizing this, uh, this famous Christian icon, taking it to Israeli uh, society, taking it to the Israeli army, to our times, and, and not losing its very basic meaning of sacrifice and of, uh, of redemption. And just a little bit of images of this exhibition that was really so well attended. I, I, I couldn't believe how many people came and, and, and saw, and this is an artist performing in front of the work that we saw by Mark Antokolsky, uh, talks that we had, um, uh, nuns that came from Abu Ghosh especially to see, so this is my, me uh, ending a uh, tour with them. That was a great thing. And again, this image that I think I will, will end with of, of this, again, very, um, it was even, I think it was just by chance that I happened to walk by and see this, this person looking at the figure of Jesus who is also wearing a kippah, right? So I like that. <laughs> so thank you very much. Mm. Mm.